some to do with music, some not. Um, and just the first answer that comes into your mind. Okay. Um, so, for example, would you rather either would you rather write a song in the mountains or on the beach? Butterfly. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Hello, people of the world. Welcome back to another episode of Sam Sessions. We're here in the Acoustic A Room of South Boston Music. Another special day today. I'm Seth Welker, the world's worst interviewer. And to my right, we have Patrice Pike. The world's best interviewee? Yes, yes. <laughs> I, I actually, yes. That's good. That's we'll good. see about that. So you set the bar low. I set mine too high. <laughs> yeah. That's the these, like polar opposites <laughs> sitting across from each other here. How are you doing today? I'm good. Yeah? Yeah. Easy day so far? So far, yeah. I mean, Monday, you know, I think ever since, you know, I, the world changed so much. I mm -hmm. think Mondays used to be, like, golden for a lot of musicians because it's kind of like a lot of musicians Saturday. Yeah, yeah, very true. I don't know if any of us have anything like a Saturday. Anymore. Any Saturdays? Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I spend my Saturdays here. So my, my quote-unquote Saturday would probably be like a Tuesday maybe. But uh, th these days are a lot of fun for me, too. This doesn't feel like work, so. I mean, I've been looking forward to it. Today. Hopefully we can keep this day easy yeah. through the interview. This is definitely the best part of my day. Good so stuff. Fun. So <clears throat> I was doing all kinds of, you know, little research and stuff. I did a deep dive on your Twitter and the whole thing. But the thing that popped out to me immediately was I went to your website, and you have all your music up on SoundCloud. Oh. Was that something that you had to do with, or someone did that for you? Uh, it's well first of all I don't think all of it's on there there's a, good a lot amount? of music that's not there, okay for sure I think what you know over the years there's always a new platform there's things going on I've been doing this since I was a teenager so I've seen mm -hmm. a lot of different things platforms you know, yeah platforms and stuff and it's just always like oh now you gotta do this now you need mm -hmm. to do this if you're not on this it's not it's not good yeah you know? yeah I don't know what you saw on Twitter but I'm almost never on Twitter but, yeah, I was just scrolling yeah. through. I was trying like do the old Sean Evans and try and find something like way buried deep in your past, bring it up, or like Nardwar, you know? <laughs> like, oh my God, how did you know this? Yeah, there's a lot of older music, I guess, on SoundCloud. It it it's really when you look at my stuff, I guess it's like whatever's on SoundCloud is when SoundCloud was like really a thing that lots mm. of people did and focused on. Mm -hmm. So it was massive for a while. Yeah. And now it's kind of died off, of course. Yeah. So I think when you actually look across platforms at different artists, unless they're, they're just crazy about being on computers all the time and they love to be on mm -hmm. social media and platforms and everything they've ever done is on all of them, that's definitely not me. Yeah. So I think a lot of artists, it's like, oh, during this period of time, all of so and so stuff is on this one. Now mm -hmm. it's over here because that's what they've been into lately, or what's yeah. where their fans are. I mean, a lot of it's like what your fans want. Mm -hmm. So, you know, Facebook was what fans wanted for a long time, and now it's Instagram. So, where is that? Depends, where your fans you know? go for your music? Where would you say I mean, they go? I mean, I'm more talking about like connection with mm -hmm. you. Okay, you know? I see. I see. Because right, you're not going to have a ton of music on Instagram. Okay, right. Yeah. But like where they want to connect with you yeah. and where they're connecting with their friends. So figuring all that out seems mm -hmm. to be a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I, can't, you, I don't claim that I've figured it out. Well, it seems like you've stayed on top of it for the most part. As best as I can. I mean, I want to be playing music and, mm -hmm. you know, I like learning new instruments and things like that. I'd much rather be doing that. I than don't, on social media. I think I'd never been on a computer more than during the shut down the pandemic mm -hmm. you know mm -hmm. and I'm really trying to get away from that so yeah I'm in a point right now where I'm really a lot of people wrote a lot of music during the pandemic and I didn't I really spent a lot of time I, I put down a lot of ideas mm. but I did two live streams a week people that love listening to me found it and I found out that a lot of people that are in towns or cities that I hadn't gone to in a long time mm -hmm. were so excited. Okay. And so I realized then I was able to bring music to people that have been wanting to hear me for a long time and they don't live in Austin or San Francisco or Chicago or New York yeah, or wherever, you know. What platforms did you use to live stream? So I ended up using Facebook because um, I played my residency at Saxon Pub 
mm. which was the very last day that pretty much any music venues were open. Mm-hmm. It was March 12th. Um, was it just a banger of a party? It was crazy. Yeah. Because everybody knew. Whereas everybody knew it was about to be. After this, we're stuck inside. Yeah. I mean, yeah. we all talked about it, and we were hugging, and we were like, might as well hug. <laughs> you know? Everything shut down, and it was so grim mm. that... Because I was already doing a Thursday regular show when I'm not out on the road, it made sense to just go and be mm-hmm. on camera on Thursday and connect with people. Yeah. And everybody was kind of in shock, too. And I think a lot of people just thought it would only last two or three months. But you know? did you go through the whole... I went through the whole thing for, like, I guess it it was definitely until Saxon Pub opened back up. So right. it had to be... At least a year, maybe fifteen months or something. I don't wow. know how long it was. So, are you still? You don't do it anymore. I haven't. I took a break for a while. Mm-hmm. And the cool thing too was that once I felt like traveling, I would do it at different places. So, like I did one in Costa oh, Rica. Yeah. I did one in Terlingua. Oh where wow! I got some land there. And yeah. I did one. Um, you know, I would tr- go to different places, California, just either a friend's house or a vacation place or right outside of my RV or whatever and it was yeah. really fun that's a really cool innovative way to power through the lockdowns yeah and I think people got excited because even the summer last summer I did some touring and clubs were just really starting to open up again and so I got to do kind of take them on tour with me a little oh bit, wow you know mm-hmm. so that was really fun and it, it felt like you know even if people weren't getting out or they weren't comfortable getting out it gave them a sense of some kind of adventure, you Mm -hmm. know, like virtual adventure. Yeah, of course. I'm curious, of course, when, when you're a musician, when you're curious music, it's not always about monetization, but were you able to monetize the live streams? Yeah, I was going to tell you, since you asked about Facebook, Mm -hmm. part of the reason I did Facebook is because it's a free platform where you already have built in ways to create events Mm -hmm. and to connect to your fans and friends really quickly and it could, it's free for them to do it. So even I have my Facebook set up where even if they don't have a Facebook profile, they can get it through just a URL. Okay, yeah. And so they didn't. It did. They don't have to be like lovers of Facebook, you know, to yeah. be on it if they wanted to see it. Um, and then you just like a lot of people did. You put your info about PayPal or Venmo for tipping, and yeah, it totally was incredible what people did for that entire time yeah kind of like a like pay what you can situation just pay whatever yeah whatever I mean, that's cool i got you know some people would pay five dollars mm-hmm. i think my highest tip was like a thousand dollars so that's a good night you know and, and so it was just it was shocking and it was mm-hmm. relieving and it was um you know i didn't feel strapped down because i could just with facebook you could just take your I could, if I was in, like for instance, well, I would find places in Terlingua. I had Wi-Fi at the um, Terlingua um, Hike and Boating Company. Right. There's two twins, Erica and Aaron, own it. And I do a river trip every year um, mm-hmm. in October. And, like, I could just perch myself outside of their boathouse where all their canoes and rafts and everything are, and they have great Wi-Fi and put up my wow. computer and actually have my computer out in the middle of the desert with a mountain behind me. And it's like a beautiful setting. Yeah, and then some really cool things happened that you weren't expecting. Like, I didn't think about the sun was going to be going down the whole time because oh, I always did wow. it at the same time, every Thursday and every Sunday. Uh-huh. And I think I'm going to start doing it on Sundays again. But, you know, you're, you're kind of just playing with nature because you don't even know if you're going to have enough sunlight left. And Man. so you're doing the show and the sun's slowly going down and the stars are coming out and, you know, the whole scene would change. And you'd see the mountain behind me with slowly the sun going down and it turning different colors from bright yellow to orange to purple. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So that's, that's, cool. that's really incredible because a lot of times most people would tell you that they'd rather go see like a show live in person. But when you sure. have like a setting like you're describing, I mean, that that's a pretty cool way to see live music too, through a live stream. Yeah, and I think, you know, definitely everybody would rather see it live. I'd much rather play it live. I was just talking to Hector Ward right before I came in, and we, he was talking about how he only did a few, and it wasn't really his thing, and mm. but he really respected everybody that kept doing it, and he watched a lot of our live streams. Yeah. But for me, it was like, I was getting a lot of feedback from people about how it impacted them. So it wasn't mm. really so much about 
you well, know, what am I getting out of it? It was it was equally like. You know, there's a lot of people during those lockdowns that were just begging for something to keep and them And totally isolated. Yeah. Totally, completely isolated. Yeah. Or the other thing that I noticed was it wasn't just that it was cool that sometimes I would change environments, but like I remember when I popped up and, and people were trying to guess where I was mm-hmm. and you could hear the monkeys and stuff when I was in <laughs> Costa Rica and I had people guessing where I was. Oh, that's That was cool. really fun. Yeah. But I think also people really liked this. They could tune in on a certain night at a certain time. They knew I was going to be there. They knew a bunch of their friends. What friends awesome. And people, people made friends. In fact, two of my really close friends became a couple <laughs> after they were on the live streams and got to know each other on the live streams. And then when they actually got to meet each other and come to live shows and had mm-hmm. never met each other at a live show. Wow. Now they've been dating and I think they're like the perfect match. And it's, it's crazy. That's so cool. Yeah. That's a really cool story to come out of it. Mm-hmm. I was curious. I think you mentioned one other person that was doing the live streams, at least for a little bit. Was it something that you had the idea for, or did someone put you onto the idea of doing the live streams? I mean, a few people did it right away. Like, I was on Facebook and saw um, Kevin Russell was doing it. Okay. From Shiny Ribs and all the bands he's ever had. I've yeah. known him since Dallas, way back when we were barely old enough to drink. And <laughs> he, uh, he was doing it just with his ukulele, having a margarita in his mm-hmm. house, you know? Yeah. And, uh... You know, people were asking me if I was going to do it. So I literally did it the following Thursday. So I didn't miss a beat. So I was at Saxon Pub, and mm. the following Thursday, I did my first one. Yeah, and the consistency, I'm sure, kind of helps keep people coming back every time. Yeah, plus I think it, you know, I got a lot of feedback that it made people feel good because it was something they could count on. When In a world that was so chaotic and everybody felt like they didn't know what was going to happen next. Mm-hmm. It just felt like calming in that way. That's, yeah. that's So it's interesting to me because... The literally the next question I was going to ask, and this kind of goes hand in hand with it, is I was watching a live performance of you and watching you engage with the crowd in between yeah. songs, and it seemed that like something that came pretty naturally to you, and it certainly helped you with the live streams during the pandemic. But is that something that like you developed over time being on stage, or first performance you were engaging with the crowd pretty? No, I mean, I can tell you the first time I ever played in a in a club was poor david's pub in dallas where i'm originally from Mm. and uh it was my band was supposed to be the last band i was 16 years old Mm -hmm. and i was really comfortable performing like playing music with my bros at rehearsal yeah but like the first time i got up and i'd been performed like singing in choirs and playing french horn and orchestra and all these different things okay so some kind of experience that's a different vibe yeah you know so actually being on the mic and I didn't have a banter thing, you know, mm-hmm. but I remember really vividly that I put my hands in my pockets and I think that people thought I had a really cool vibrato, but I was actually kind of shaking. <laughs> it's just that first time, uh-huh. you know, yeah. and, but that was, you know, that was when I was a kid. And so over the years, I, I always tell people, not everyone that is a musical artist necessarily likes people. Mm-hmm. You don't have to be. You don't have to be a person that really loves other humans to be a great musician. I feel like more often than not, it helps if you are. If yeah, you do. Yeah. You know, not everyone does. Some what? people are cranky and yeah, right. No, I, I was saying I feel like people. almost more often musicians don't aren't like super people lovers. You know. Oh yeah, yeah I guess I've met all kinds for mm-hmm. sure, but I just got lucky that I do. I do like people, so... Yeah, that's cool. I think it comes across. Have you ever had, like, just a wild exchange with a crowd member up on stage? I mean, you always get those, like... It's funny because sometimes they're people that actually love you the most, but they're just, like, drunk or (laughs) in some weird kind of mood or something. Uh They might say some things. They don't have an internal governor, and you're just like, oh, man, I know this person, or who's that person? Uh Uh-huh. You know, uh... The weirdest thing is just when you get like people that become obsessed with you. That's that's the only bad thing mm. that I think. People talking in a in a club and I'm usually able to kind of reel it in and find a way to without being a, a jerk right. know, to to kind of bring it back into uh-huh. where it needs to be so everyone else can enjoy. Yeah, you know? of course. And I'm not distracted. Yeah, yeah. Do you, so do you like do you ignore it or do you just kind of like play into it where you can I mean I think the most brilliant I'll use someone else as an example the most okay. brilliant example of what you're asking me about that 
is like masterful was uh, I think it was Dolly Parton. She was playing at Moody Theater, and I think some guy said something. I don't even know what it was, but I think she said something like, uh, you know, I'm glad you're here, but I told you to stay in the trunk or something like that. You know, it's just like, oh my God. You know, Dolly Parton is so smart, yeah. so witty, so fast. Yeah. And uh, I'm not that quick. <laughs> I'm not that quick with humor at all. Yeah. So, but I think it's, I think it's better to just address it in some way because uh-huh. otherwise, it, you know. A lot of times, not, if you don't address it, I feel like then they're like, oh, I need to be louder and like more ridiculous. Yeah. And if you're in certain venues, there's people to handle that stuff. But right. when you're not, then you have to figure out how to handle it on your own. And if, yeah, if people, if you ignore them, they usually just get, worse yeah of yeah. course so talking about playing on stage i know originally you were playing with uh little sister mm-hmm. and then that you either switched or that became sister seven and i was curious about the transition there was it the same yeah. group or totally different group same group okay a, a cover band cover bar band in massachusetts mm. was able to prove that they had the name little sister something like two or three weeks before we did from oh, a newspaper article. Wow. So it was a trademarking issue. Mm. And they wanted us to change our name or they'd give us the name for $40,000. And we were like, nah. <laughs> Not worth it. You know, and we'd just gotten signed to Arista Records and Arista was just like, you know, you could spend forty grand, And they couldn't even stop us from doing anything other than going to Massachusetts. Oh, really? I think was really the the right bottom there. line. Mm-hmm. And for us, I think we could have kept Little Sister and just never gone to Massachusetts. And been Even fine. though Boston is really cool. I mean, yeah. we had some cool shows there. But uh, in the end, we just decided to change the name. So, yeah, it was the same people. Where did uh, Sister 7 come from? So there were seven bands that we, when we started doing a deeper dive, mm. we found out that there were other bands that didn't have a claim, really, because they weren't together anymore. Mm-hmm. Um, and they didn't, they'd never had a big, big enough, you know, hit or anything to, for them to care for it to be a thing in court. Mm-hmm. But, um, even like Sly and the Family Stone, I guess, I think his backup singers were called Little Sister. Oh, really? You know, and there, there, there were some other bands. So technically there were seven other Little Sisters that could have had a trademark. Okay. So we're like, we'll just be Sister Seven. Okay, cool. Yeah. Plus I was born in 1970. I'm the singer. We... We really wanted to not have any situation where a record company would easily be able to say, well, we want to put the lead singer's name in the band, Patrice Pike, and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Because we had some friends that had, that had happened to. Right. Edie Brickell and the New Bohemians, for example. So, oh, okay. And they're, they were from Dallas, too, and they're older than us, and so we kind of knew about that. <laughs> just that to try and happen. avoid it. Sometimes they just want to market like the singer, and we wanted to be... You know, a whole all-inclusive band. Democracy, yeah. Yeah. Totally. How, how long did you play with uh, Sister Seven? In total, I think we were together for 10 years. Oh, wow. Mm-hmm. Did you guys tour all over the place? Yeah. We toured all over. We didn't really go to Canada. We toured all over the United States and mm-hmm. Western Europe for mm-hmm. the most part. What was your uh, favorite, like, what, like, favorite, con- or, you know, part of Western Europe? What would have been your favorite, if you could remember? Well, I mean, I really, I think my favorite shows ever in Europe were in Paris. We oh, this, wow. Like, every single night residency for two weeks in Paris. Jeez. It was amazing. Yeah, that's cool. So we only had to work, so we only had to set up one time, right? Because mm-hmm. we're there every night for two weeks. Mm-hmm. So there's no other move your stuff, sound yeah. check. So we literally had 22 hours a day off in Paris. All expense paid, wow. getting getting paid on top of it, and just show up at the bar, play for two and a half hours, you know. That's two, incredible. Two, two and a half hours. They did like a radio simulcast uh-huh. all across Paris. That's incredible. It was rad. It was really, really fun. Yeah. Wow. Did it, I guess, so if you're there for two weeks, you kind of can move past just doing all the touristy stuff. Like, did you see the Eiffel Tower? Yeah. I mean, we went inside, we're there for two full weeks. Right. You know, and, and. I mean, we did everything from, we made lots of friends, too, because it's not like mm-hmm. you're a tourist in the sense that, you know, we were meeting people that were falling in love with our music. Yeah. And we had this instant community, mm-hmm. you know, and so we were getting that combination of, you see some of the coolest 
you know, tourism kind of stuff and historical stuff of Paris, but you're also instantly, you know, with friends and having dinners with local people and, Mm -hmm. you know, really getting the gist of what it's like for Parisians. Yeah. It was neat. Yeah, it's not so much like just visiting the city. Yeah. Kind of got to feel like you lived there for a bit. I'm jealous. I'm super jealous of that. I've always wanted to go to Paris. Yeah, you should go. It seems like a cool place. Definitely do it. How has it been um, playing with Wayne Sutton over the years? It's been great. I mean, Wayne and I are like family. Mm -hmm. We met, I was 16 and he was 17. Oh, wow. Okay. You know, we didn't play yet then. Mm -hmm. A friend of his brought him to see my band play. Okay. And hear me sing because this guy, Perry, he thought we'd be great. Mm-hmm. working together and he was right yeah you know so it was actually we were friends and just knew each other for a while and then we started little sister a few years later yeah that's cool it's interesting because i feel like if you know someone for that long you you know you like create this kind of chemistry between you two and that definitely shows on stage as well yeah i mean i don't know if they you would think they probably have i mean there's all kinds of scientific research out there and stuff about everything under the sun but yeah but i think it would surprise me if they hadn't done tried to do some kind of research about what happens, not just for like, you know, two people that have that kind of connection, but for a whole band as well that play it together for a long time. I know, you know, lots of friends um, ex- express what it's like that mm-hmm. you begin to sort of be connected, just like your nervous systems become connected. You mm-hmm. begin to intuit, not just. It's not just, I don't think it's just an automatic intu- intuitive, you kind of know where people are going to go from their tendencies or whatever. I think that you're, there's something about the way when you spend that much time playing music and going on the road with people, being mm-hmm. in a tour bus or a band or however you do it, spending that much time together, you become a unit. And I th- I'm so curious about what that actually looks like scientifically. Yeah. You know? Yeah, no, I totally get it. Yeah, I've never thought about it that deeply before but I mean I I have had the same friend of mine for like I think be 13 years now 13 or 14 years Mm -hmm. so it's like more than half of my life and I definitely know what you're talking about with that or it's yeah it's not like just because of their mannerisms you know what they're gonna do next it's almost yeah an intuitive thing yeah it really is I think that's one of the hard things about how the music business has changed in that it's harder to have a band together where everybody is committed to the band and only playing with that band for the most part and so very connected Mm -hmm. because everybody's just trying to make a living yeah and everybody's like playing in lots of different bands and Mm -hmm. lots of people have four gigs a night Mm -hmm. I think you know something gets lost with that what we're talking about gets lost yeah of course Mm -hmm. What are uh, some of the struggles that you've experienced playing with the same people for so long? I mean, I know it's, you know, of course, a lot of fun and everything, but it's impossible to avoid any kind of... Yeah, I think the hardest thing is when you, if you're in a band for a long time, you may have different cultural backgrounds. Mm -hmm. You know, you may have different religious or spiritual backgrounds, different belief systems. Mm -hmm. And I think when you first get in a band, if you're all like really into playing together just like in any relationship. Yeah. You know, it's like there's the honeymoon period uh-huh. and then you can <laughs> yeah. start to figure out what yeah. is really going on yeah. with each other, yourself included, as that mirror. Yeah. So I think, you know, over over time, you know, some of those cultural things or just ways you were raised or your belief systems can really start to... to they can either really bring you together or they can really tear people apart. Right. I think when you're in close contact with each other and you never get space like if you're traveling in like i said a van or a tour bus and you're always up in each other's stuff mm-hmm. yeah. you, know, you need space and i oh, remember sure. being on the road like 10 or 12 weeks at a time and yeah. you know like you've got somebody that was raised a certain way and you start to find out that they have beliefs about you that you didn't mm-hmm. know about that can be really hard yeah you know i, I think um yeah, I think there's also power dynamics in bands, you know. Oh, of course. The thing about, you know, over time, if someone feels like they don't have as much power as you do in terms of how it's all playing out in the music business, that can be very hard on bands. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times some people don't realize that, like, if you're feeling a lack of power or a lack of having a voice, um, which I felt at times, which might probably surprise people, um, <laughs> since I'm the lead person in most bands I've ever been in. Mm-hmm. 
but um, you know, different dynamics inside the band can take over. Like there might mm. be a rhythm section or uh-huh. you know, two best friends in a band, mm-hmm. you know, and they start to like really, um, you know, kind of take over the whole. Yeah, thing. it's interesting. It can happen. Yeah, and I've for seen sure. all kinds of situations. I mean, so I, I've never played in a band or anything, but the one thing I could connect it with is like I've seen it happen in friend groups before. You know, yeah. if you have like a group of like six buddies and you're always hanging out, you can kind of see that happen as well. Yeah. So what would you say is like the most important thing to like keep that from becoming such a major issue that it does separate the whole band? I think that, um, you know, back in the day when, you know, our income stream, a lot of bands income streams were a lot better there were more, there were less bands. There was a greater balance of like industry people to help manage bands. Mm-hmm. I think it's really good to have a good manager. Yeah. Because that can bring in a lot of balance. It can also be someone to come in and help solve problems. Of course. It can be someone that's on the outside mm-hmm. that can look in and, and see what's going on from a different perspective. Yeah. And um, yeah, I think that can help a lot. But also just trying to have good communication and learn. You can learn things about relationships, you know, how, how to make relationships better. Yeah. Um, you know, through all kinds of ways and apply that to your band. Of course. Yeah, I think like the most common answer there would probably be like communication. Yeah. Just like and open and honest. I think that's the other thing is the more musicians are working really hard to just make a living, to scratch a living out, mm-hmm. you you have less time to do those things. Yeah, You have of less time to tend to the relationships. Mm-hmm. And I mm-hmm. think that that can cause bands to suffer. Yeah. Well, it's, it's always really cool to see, you know, not just a band, but like a really, really talented band like yours to like stick together throughout the years. It's, it's you Like I said, you see it on stage when they play too. Like, oh, these guys have been yeah. together forever. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's <clears throat> it's uh, it's magical, for yeah, sure. Absolutely. Uh, and I hope I have this right. Your first album came out in 2004? Well, I mean, there were like demos and things like that okay. before that. I had bands before Little Sister. Right. I started when I was 16. So, yeah. you know, there were, um, I think the first, the first album I made that wasn't really a demo was in, it was probably, I guess it would have technically have been Little Sister because okay. I wouldn't call anything before that an actual album release yeah full album release so that would have been in 92 do you remember what that feeling was like so sister seven wasn't together after 2000 okay yeah really yeah but so you still play with Wayne Sutton though oh yeah okay gotcha yeah do you remember what the the feeling of the first album release was like uh well I think so the first real album that we made was before we were on a major label. We did that on a, a, a small indie label that a bunch of bands got together with a man, two managers and created in mm-hmm. Dallas. And so we made we made one and put it out, and then we got a record deal. Mm-hmm. And I think that's the one that I remember the most because we were making a live album at Club Dotto, which is an iconic venue mm-hmm. in Dallas, Deep Bellum. Okay. And we had one of those big 18-wheeler, like, full analog studio situations. Well, this roll was up whole into thing. downtown Dallas. Wow. And record all three shows, three nights in a row. That's pretty incredible. And it was outrageous. It was like, you know, I think they crammed something like six or 700 people in there every night. And wow. Yeah, we did. I think we actually did Friday, Saturday night and Sunday late afternoon early evening Mm -hmm. it was crazy it was a Mm -hmm. crazy party yeah i can't imagine do you remember like the volume of people there i mean it was just insane it was yeah you're not supposed to put that many people in there (laughs) (laughs) and people bust in like people like there were some people that brought a bus from austin no way like rented a whole like passenger bus like a giant one (laughs) and came all the way to dallas because technically we were living in Austin and Dallas at the time. We were playing here so much in downtown mm-hmm. Austin. Mm-hmm. And they didn't want to miss that, so. Yeah. Okay. Man, that's crazy. I can't imagine that. We should have been around for it. It would have been fun to watch. What's um what's it been like, you know, playing in Austin over the years? I'm sure you've seen crazy amounts of change. Yeah, for sure. I mean, there's lots of good and bad. 
Mm -hmm. sad. I'm sure it wouldn't surprise me if lots of people that you interview say, what a drag it is, all the venues that have closed down over the years. Yeah, we get a bit of a mix of both. Um, but yeah, yeah, there's, there's definitely a, a sense of like, oh man, it's yeah. not definitely not what it was back in like the 80s and 90s. Yeah. Where like, I hear stories about that. I, I, feel, get, I feel bad for you guys. I, yeah, I get super jealous. You don't jealous. have Liberty Lunch. You don't have, uh -huh. like there's all these amazing venues that got caught up in the, the big change of, of real estate becoming really valuable. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Steamboat. Still happening, yeah. Yeah, you used to play Steamboat, right? Yeah, I mean, we were, we played, it was Sister Seven and Bob Schneider that played the last two nights that it was open. Oh, no kidding. Yeah, we were the very last weekend, yeah. I bet that was another just outrageous party. Outrageous party, and everybody was, what was such Sean's a mix of like? emotions. Yeah, what was Sean's dad like? Man, he was just such a cool guy that loved music so much. Mm -hmm. I mean, what, what was his name? Danny Crooks. Danny Crooks. Yeah. Okay. He's just he, he's still with us. Yeah, yeah. No, I know, but I've never met him. I've never. Oh, he's a legend either. in your mind. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> well, because yeah, I work with Sean. You know, at least five days out of the week, and I hear him talk about Steamboat all the time, and it's one of those like mini places that I never got to experience. Legendary. And, yeah. yeah. I mean, I I'm sure Danny comes by the shop sometimes, but rarely. Yeah. So I, I've yeah. never met Danny, and I know how Sean is, so I can only imagine what his dad's Have you like. ever been to see music in New Orleans? Mm -mm. I went to New Orleans once, mid mid, uh, not like mid lockdown, but pretty much mid lockdown. Okay. I was just asking because I was just there in the days between Jazz Fest weekends. Oh wow! It was like a whole thing. Mm -hmm. They have all kinds of shows and mini festivals and stuff. Yeah. But there's a a venue there, and I was standing there with some friends who had been to Steamboat back in the day. Mm -hmm. We were watching uh, Dragon Smoke. It's oh, wow. two guys from Galactic, Ivan mm -hmm. Neville and uh, Eric. Lindell and uh, Killer Band and they were playing Tipitinas mm -hmm. and I just looked around and there's a whole balcony all around Tipitinas and just the whole vibe was just like Steamboat wow. and I just had this flashback you know of, of just how Steamboat amazing days. Steamboat was yeah was was the name of the place called again Tipitinas Tipitinas yeah. I'm gonna have to check that out for Gal sure the guys in Galactic own it now okay yeah yeah because yeah, i i that's yeah it's one of the top ones i get jealous about when i hear stories about steamboat back in the day of course sean has all these stories about it epic your song um sweet november mm -hmm. i heard you kind of like give a little context to the song before you performed it uh, and you're basically saying that it's about like the way that you get this like overwhelming emotions during the the changing of the seasons mm -hmm. right and seasons are changing right now i'm curious like is it all good overwhelming emotions is it a mix of good and bad or definitely a mix i mean mm -hmm. i don't know anybody that just writes only from a place of good some people trick trick you yeah. and you'll be here it's <laughs> such a jammy fun song it makes then, me so happy and then you really listen to the words and you're like oh shit <laughs> yeah, like this is Whoa, morbid that's heavy yeah. Yeah. yeah but no all kinds of emotions with sweet november it was the change of seasons it was so radical that day we were in our, we had a tour bus with Sister Seven. Mm -hmm. I think Fastball was playing down the street. And I, I was about to get out and walk down to the club that Fastball was playing in. And uh, and I, I, was, I had plenty of time. And I think I got out of the bus. And I didn't realize that the weather had just changed in the last hour. And yeah. it got really cold. And, you know, that there's almost like a smell when oh, cold yeah. weather comes in. You know, mm -hmm. it's like brisk. And, uh, yeah, I just had this, all these emotions come over me. It reminded me of being in New England during a time of season change. And mm -hmm. I just had all these kind of memories of that, what was going on in my life at the time. Yeah. That's what that, that's yeah, I know like. exactly what that feeling like. It's super refreshing for me. Oh, it's good. All, yeah, it's always, like, really refreshing. But, yeah, I thought it was interesting because I'll, I'll what for me, what takes me back a lot of times is, like, music, like a song I used to listen to, like, when I was 10 or whatever, that will bring back memories of that. Mm -hmm. But... Never necessarily felt that way with the season changing, so I've always thought that was interesting. And um, one of my favorite songs by you was uh, Let the Music Get You High. Yeah. yeah. Did I say that title right? Yeah, yeah. I love that song. That's uh, Wayne and I. Wayne and I wrote that together. Uh -huh. is, mm -hmm. there, is there a story behind like the creation of it? Yeah, I mean, when we started writing that record, which the album was Hard as a Compass, which was mm -hmm. we were finishing it right before the pandemic happened. Okay. Um. My niece had had a bone marrow 
failure mm-hmm. and she had been in the hospital and we'd been through a lot as a family mm-hmm. and I was helping to take care of her. And, uh, so it was kind of in retrospect from that. It was just about like, you know, I remember being with her and music was really something that would lift her spirits mm-hmm. when she was going through so much um, yeah. pain and suffering with her illness. And, uh, and, and that's that way for me too. And of course, you know, so Wayne and I could really connect about that. And mm-hmm. um, so there's lyrics throughout the song. It says, uh, I woke up this morning from a long night's sleep. And the ground that was cracked and dry was filled with water that we ought to remember we need. Mm-hmm. I put down that needle in the vinyl groove. And the house was filled with a song so good. Mm-hmm. I remember life is tender, but we all want to be so strong. Mm-hmm. And so I started with that verse because, you know, I had been thinking the water, we'd been in a drought here. Mm -hmm. You know, it's like so important for us to get good water. Our trees were dying, you know, like the the rivers were so low or empty in certain parts, Pedernalis, stuff Mm -hmm. like that. And then the analogy about how music is that way, like putting the needle inside the groove, just like the water in the river. Mm-hmm. you know, analogy and like putting that needle in there and then the house being filled with music. Yeah. You know, and then later uh, I said, I, I want to wrap up my anger, uh, go down to the river and sink her, um, play a song that you love, yada, yada, yada. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, oh, play a song that you love, let it lift you above or something like that. Let the music get you high. It's hard to remember lyrics when you're not actually singing. And yeah, playing. right. Not playing but, uh, you know what I mean? with it. Yeah, but then uh, the next verse is about some about my family. It's uh-huh. just about, you know, working hard and about one of my family members, you know, trying to, to help the family, mm-hmm. help take care of Cameron, trying to kind of keep it anonymous. But, um, but just about, you know, the emptiness mm-hmm. and, and what you need to fill yourself up, you know, mm-hmm. and that how hard it is when you're trying to work so hard and take care of your family and there's just doesn't seem like enough time and not enough money. Yeah. And that music can, that music is like medicine for a lot of people. I mean, it's a really beautiful song and certainly makes sense, especially now knowing like where the song came from, you know, because you you can kind of sense through the song, there's definitely some meaning behind it. Um, But yeah, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's, there's times if uh, I'm down, I listen to a certain song, I feel great again. Or, you know, like if, if I'm too happy, I need to mellow myself out a little bit. I know the song to play yeah. for that too. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's incredible. I love that song. I definitely get to listen to it with new ears now too. Yeah, the part where it says uh, in the next verse, um, it's got change in her pocket, but she doesn't have shoes. Mm. That was about, I mean, it's reflected in like families with, you know, people that come from poor families or lower middle class families. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I remember when my mom, when I was little and my mom had holes in her shoes and her nursing shoes, you know, Mm -hmm. but I had new, I had new shoes. She made sure I had good shoes to go to school in, you know? Yeah. And then the next lyric is, uh, um, she had blood in her veins, but little time left to lose. And that was my niece. Like she didn't, Mm -hmm. her bone marrow wasn't making blood anymore. And like she, she had a, there was only so much time before that was, either going to end her life or Mm -hmm. fortunately she got a stem cell transplant that's good yeah i'm I'm glad that it that's you know a better case scenario rather than the way it could have gone it's it's crazy because my favorite thing about musicians is you know almost everybody has like something gnarly happen to them throughout life you know Mm -hmm. something bad but like what the coolest thing about musicians is whenever something bad happens to one of them it's almost always that they're able to create some art from it. Mm-hmm. And uh, yeah, it's definitely my favorite part because it's just, you know, when something horrible happens to me, all I'm going to do is bitch and complain, you know? Yeah, I mean, that definitely was a tricky part for me during the pandemic because mm-hmm. I had so much, I mean, I have so much to be grateful for. The mm-hmm. live streams were so incredible. Yeah. But I also had a lot of really rough feelings, you know? And of a course. lot, and then when you've got in an entire community that are feeling that, Oh my god! So overwhelming. So, yeah. I didn't really have a lot of super positive things to say, mm-hmm. and so I chose not to write during that time. I just didn't want to put. I just didn't want to write a plethora of music that was depressing. I didn't want to fake it and try yeah. to write happy stuff. 
So I just played live streams. I put down some song ideas occasionally. Mm -hmm. And I also founded a nonprofit. So I worked really hard to keep that nonprofit sustainable. Wow. Throughout that time. That's really, really cool self-awareness to know that you're like, whatever I come up with right now is just going to be downtrodden and... Yeah, I just felt like... It's like not a good time to write right people now. People I was playing for didn't need to hear that. Uh-huh. And it's That's not that cool. they're... I could have probably come up with some really great material. Yeah. But the thing yeah. to me is like, I have those memories, you know. Mm -hmm. I can always go down into the vault and remember what that was like. And come up with you some know? kind of and song just, about yeah, it. Yeah, I just felt like it was healthier for me not to go there. Yeah. More than I already was emotionally. Of course. Wow, that's incredible. Um, so I, for the next part of the show, mm -hmm. I'll ask kind of quick questions. Mm -hmm. You know, just pick your brain about random stuff. Some to do with music, some not. Okay. Um, and just the first answer that comes into your mind. Okay. Um, so for example, would you rather either, would you rather write a song in the mountains or on the beach? Butterfly. Just kidding. <laughs> I was like, it's like a psychologist thing. Yeah. Like, what do you see? <laughs> what do you see in the ink bot? Yeah. <laughs> Awesome. <laughs> this is really therapy. This is what we're actually doing here. Mountains. Mountains for sure? Well, I mean, that's the first thing that comes to mind. Okay, gotcha. Uh, let's see. If you're going out and you you know, you know got some cash with you, would you have uh, $520 bills or $100 bill? Oh, uh, $520. So. Okay. How about when you're hanging out in like a group of people and, you know, socially, some people are smoking cigarettes or some people are hitting e-cigs. Would you rather be with the people that are Wait, smoking? smoking cigarettes or what? Or e six. Oh. Are you even have you seen have you seen the ESIC craze yet? Of course. Okay, so I which mean, which yeah. group of people would you rather be around in the social circle? Mmm. Gosh, that's hard to say. <laughs> I guess e cigs? I don't uh, know. I, so far everyone's had cigarettes and Well, they're probably former smokers. Yeah. <laughs> I, I guess so. I guess I so. mean I smoke socially off and on over the uh -huh. years in the distant past, mm -hmm. but like Man, it's cigarette smoke, especially the steamboat back in the day. <laughs> Is it gnarly? Yeah. I imagine, yeah. yeah. I still pray all the time. God, please, where, whatever is out there, please don't let me, like, have gotten cancer from the steamboat smokers. <laughs> <laughs> Blowing smoke in my face constantly while I'm taking big he heaving breaths and singing my ass off, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's that's a hell of a way to go. So nothing sure. against the smokers. Yeah, you know, but, but just keep it out of your uh, face. I was just super sensitive to it, yeah. Uh-huh. Debit or credit? Uh, debit. Mm-hmm. Me too. Um, well, it depends, right? Yeah, I suppose. You're buying a $3,000 guitar, it's probably going to be on credit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Here at, at South Austin Music. I can't even get a credit card. It's so not going to be on my debit card, babe. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I'm, I, I'm always debit because I just literally can't get a credit card. So. Uh, <laughs> talk so to much. me about that later. Would you rather get caught up in a TV series or a movie? Movie, yeah. Okay. You like electric or acoustic? Mm. Split right down the middle. Mm. Martin or Gibson? Gibson, I've never had a Martin. Oh, really? I can't say that I wouldn't love having one, but I we just got plenty of them right here. Yeah, just... get my credit card out. Yeah, <laughs> just throwing <laughs> it out there, you know. Uh, when you're playing your uh, new Gibson that you might get, uh, mm -hmm. are you finger picking or playing with the pick? I play with the pick. Okay, cool. Yeah, I'd uh, like to learn how to finger pick more. Yeah. You, you teach me how to do that? Uh, <laughs> I can't. I can't teach you the order of a string. <laughs> <Okay. laughs> That's like E A D G B E. I do have there that one down. Okay. Yeah, there you go. That's the yeah. end of my knowledge. Start and end right there. Okay. Um, what about uh, you play with pedals? I do. Yeah. You like overdrive or uh, distortion? You want to guess? Oh, distortion. Neither. Guess what distortion pedal I have? J H S. Give you a hint. It's green. Bonsai. Mm -hmm. <laughs> tube screamer. Tube screamer. Okay. okay. You know what's Vintage actually, tube screamer. You nice. know what's really messed up about that is, by the way, my pedal knowledge is even worse than just my guitar knowledge. Okay. Um, but I was gonna say overdrive or tube screamer, not knowing that tube screamer was just a part of the distortion <laughs> pedals. So I almost wow. guessed that wow. before you even gave me the chance. Yeah. Um, green's a dead giveaway. That's how I knew you did. Yeah. Well, Bonsai's green too, right? But that's modeling after Tube Screamers. Okay. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, so did the you Tube Screamer wannabes. When she said, when she said, uh, 
which which one I have, I said JHS. I only guess that because they have like just the pedal that says distortion. On oh my it. Yeah. I love you. I didn't <laughs> and, know like, you didn't the know these I, That's fun. None of it. That's none fun. of it at all. Um, yeah, it's great. It's yeah, learn stuff every day here. It's good. I don't, have, I don't have much of pedal knowledge, so. Okay, well then, we're, yeah, I'm sure you have a lot more than me. If we had a conversation about pedals for five minutes, you would suddenly start thinking you're a pedal genius. Oh, for sure. I like that. Yeah. I'm definitely not. <laughs> we, we, I'm get a creature sure. of habit. I don't collect like and try other. It's like I like this. I like this tone. I'm sticking. With Go that. back to what you I've like. Had this pedal for a long time and keep putting new, <laughs> you know, parts in it. Mm-hmm. That's cool. What about a uh, cat or dog? Dog. Yeah. Car or truck truck what kind right of outside the window oh no way that's you <laughs> is that a toyota i can no, only see the a, back out there's a black ram down there oh okay okay it's my small car nice car. nice so is that like your like ideal truck too I'm gonna make all the prius drivers mad now <laughs> <laughs> if they weren't mad about that they're mad about something i can't put before. my pa in a prius yeah <laughs> sorry sorry <laughs> uh, if you're talking on the phone with someone, maybe a romantic interest, maybe just a longtime friend, would you rather it be over text or over the phone? Definitely on the phone, man. You yeah. Know, texting, I'm so tired of it, but yeah. just can't help but do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it does happen sometimes, but on the phone. See, I get I get annoyed at being on the phone too much sometimes. Like, you know, the hour-long phone conversations where you get to 45 minutes and you're like, we we have nothing else to talk about. Oh, yeah. But you don't want to necessarily get off the phone because it feels rude. You know, I think that's where texting comes into good play. I see. You see anyway. I'm getting to know you. <laughs> I'm supposed to be getting to know you. you, should be, you should, I would love it if this was this. The whole interview is called Seth. Get to know me. <laughs> yeah. We've definitely. I can definitely say you are the world's best interviewee. After Woo! this, yeah, you've definitely definitely won that title for sure. All right, I got a couple more here. Coffee or tea? Coffee. Okay, book that's or a lie. <laughs> is it tea <laughs> okay here's the story i know i'm supposed to give you short answers no, no i like it uh i love coffee mm-hmm. but i gave it up oh you're one during of those. the pandemic because mm. my anxiety was just like it does do that tea yeah but mm-hmm. I, I i have a little bit of decaf every once in a while yeah like really good the good stuff yeah yeah yeah. yeah. not just coffee like drinkers would be like what even is that yeah they're actually as good you like know where the beans came from and everything yeah and i get totally you know buzzed on the decaf now so that's cool yeah my pops had to give up coffee too triggers the the flight or fight flight you know which one the response too much (laughs) yeah i know which one very experienced way more experienced with that than guitar pedals yeah okay (laughs) well me too that's good that's good um would you rather read a book or listen to the audio book read okay and, hmm. Do you know why? You want to know why. Yeah, yeah, I do. I can't Some wait to find audio books, the people reading them. Oh, really? Their voices. Like that? You're like, I'm so excited about this book. And then you turn on the audio book and you're like, this person is driving me crazy. They like read too <laughs> slow too. Yeah. Yeah. yeah there, I found myself, this is, <laughs> this is terrible. So a lot of times on TikTok, this totally doesn't even need to be a part of it but a lot of times on tiktok they'll have like these reddit stories you know and it's like uh-huh. a the machine voice reading up this story uh, and i can't listen to them anymore because i get into the story and i start like reading ahead but then the voice is throwing me off behind oh yeah 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 Yeah, so i definitely agree you have to read the book because then totally. you get to go at your own pace i like my voice in my head uh-huh too. yeah yeah and when it gets exciting you get to like get excited you can make it, it musical too uh, like, I, don't, I i love music and i like i like for a book to sound, I hear it's an audio book in my head because I'm reading to myself. Yeah. You know yeah. what I mean? But when that guy's reading to me and he's like, nah, 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 I'm just like, <laughs> cut this guy off. Give me the book. What about like long car rides though? Do you listen to like podcasts or anything or is it just always music? Uh, pretty much. I listen to music. I do like podcasts better than audio books. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. That makes mm-hmm. sense. Um, okay. Last one. Austin to Nashville. Austin. Austin always. Come on. Yeah, that's a good one. Even now, even after all the change. Hey, I, I think Nashville's amazing, uh-huh. but I'm I'm not a country music singer. Yeah. Hey, I know that there's rock and roll there. I know there's soul music. I know there's Americana. Yeah. But the culture is largely like centered around its history of country music. Yeah. For me, that's not so much for me. And born and raised in Texas. Yeah. It's a good place to be born and raised, yeah. for sure. 
Thank you so much, Patrice. I totally got lost in that conversation. I hope we got good answers out of you. I hope so too. I was just like super focused on on the conversation there. That was that was really okay. fun. I'm that terrified of, of all the crazy faces I made. On camera. <laughs> so That's what makes it interesting as a visual. That's what yeah, makes I'm it sure. Fun. Don't make sure to zoom right in. Like... <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Uh, that's awesome. Thank you so much. That You're really welcome, was man. a lot of fun. Yeah, that was fun. Um, and if we could get you to play something before you yeah. leave, that'd be sweet. Do I need to play something else? Whatever you, I brought that just in case. I whatever didn't know if you, you guys play. were having people bring their guitars. No, if what. you want to play yours, more than welcome to. If you want to play one of these, you got it. I mean, it's set up the way I like it.
should remember. You should remember. 